Flashman and the Redskins by George MacDonald Frazier, book review. So this is the seventh book in the Flashman series. If you've been watching this channel, I've been reviewing all the books up until this point. Uh, the original source material, Tom Brown's School Days. The first book, Flashman, Royal Flash, Flash for Freedom, Flashman at the Charge, Flashman in the Great Game, Flashman's Lady, and here I am with book number seven, Flashman and the Redskins. Uh, so these books, again, if you're not familiar, uh, follow the exploits of the fictional Flashman all around the British Empire. Uh, most of the books, he's out in some sort of far-flung, exotic corner of the world. In this book, he's in the United States uh, for the whole book, from beginning to end. He spends a whole part. He spends a whole period of the book within the United States. So. I'm from the United States, so this is not kind of your typical uh, exotic area of the world book, but it is quite interesting and it's a reminder that at the time the American West was considered exotic to the people in Europe. Uh, the, the, these books were originally written for a British audience. Um, the book is, sorry, the story is divided into two parts. The first part takes place uh, in 1849 to 1850, right after the events described in the third book, Flash for Freedom. Um, after book number five, the, book starts, the books start to jump around in chronology. So even though this is book number seven, uh, it kind of jumps back in time to the events right after the third book. So in 1849 to 1850, Flashman ends up taking part in a great migration of wagon trains across the American West caused by the 1849 gold rush. But it's not your standard wagon train across the plains story. There's a bit of a twist. Through the usual series of convoluted events, Flashman ends up in charge of a wagon train of prostitutes who are going out to set up a new brothel in Santa Fe. Now, these Flashman books can be pretty ludicrous, to be sure. They're also occasionally a bit trashy. But they're great guilty pleasures. Knowing what we know about Flashman's character, we know that if he's on a wagon train full of prostitutes, he's not going to be able to resist temptation. And it's obvious he's going to get himself into plenty of trouble before the trip is over. The pleasure is in waiting to see exactly how Flashman will manage to screw things up this time. However, as usual in these books, mixed in with the guilty pleasure are a lot of historical tidbits. This book is even more heavily footnoted than the previous Flashman volumes. There's 81 historical endnotes in total, meaning that just about every couple, every couple of pages, you have to break from the story and flip to the back of the book to find out that so-and-so was actually a real historical person, or that such-and-such -such was a real place, or that this or that event really happened in history. As always, these books are th so thoroughly researched that it makes a great way to justify reading otherwise trashy stories. The second half of the book is loosely connected to the events of the first half, but also a little bit separate. Uh, it takes place in 1875 to 1876 and is focused on Custer's Last Stand and the events leading up to it. Now, if you know anything about Flashman, he's a coward and a self-preservationist. So the last place he wants to be is at Custer's last stand, but through the usual series of convoluted events, he ends up being present at the battle in spite of doing just about everything he can to avoid being there. Now, Custer's Last Stand is one of those infamous historical events that everybody has heard about, but nobody really knows anything about. Or maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I, I certainly knew about 
Custer's last stand, but I didn't know why they were fighting that battle. I mean, what, what was the issue or what was the series of events leading up to that conflict? And I never knew exactly what military blunders Custer had made that allowed him to get into this famous military debacle. Uh, this, this book does a pretty good job of walking you through the major historical points. Flashman is at the meeting with the Native Americans when the negotiations break down. Uh, Flashman, the narrator, is of the opinion that the negotiations were intended to break down so that the government would have an excuse to go to war. Uh, that's the American government. Flashman also spends a lot of times with cut a lot of time with Custer in the months leading up to the conflict. The picture painted of Custer may border on being a little bit cliche and one-dimensional, which is maybe typical of these Flashman books. I often find that their um, their portraits of characters tend to be a little bit one-dimensional. Um, Custer is portrayed as an emotionally fragile, glory-seeking basket case, and that's pretty much the one-note characterization that gets hit on over and over again. Um, but then again, it's all backed up with historical footnotes. So George MacDonald Fraser, the author, has gone through considerable lengths to point out that his portrayal of Custer is backed up by the historical sources. And then finally, at the actual battle itself, the actual Custer's Last Stand, uh, narrator Flashman sees exactly how Custer allowed himself to blunder into a much bigger Native American force. And again, it's backed up by the footnotes. So, uh, that's my general review of this book. I have a few other random thoughts, which I'll get to in no particular order. Thought number one. Flashman in all these books is always portrayed as an anti-hero. You root for him to survive because he's the only protagonist you've got. But at the same time, you're kind of hoping for him to get his just desserts. And usually, most of, the evil de most of his evil deeds do come back to bite him in the butt one way or the other. In the past books, Flashman has done some truly despicable things, and he continues to push the boundaries in this book. For example, he sells a colored girl into slavery to pocket the money. He also participates in the massacre of a Native American tribe, uh, albeit not willingly. Uh, he's in a position where he has to participate in the massacre or he's going to get killed himself. Uh, but still, he doesn't hesitate to kill the Indians if it will save himself. This put me off the book a bit. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it. I, I think when writing about an anti-hero, there is a fine line. On the one hand, the whole point of this series of books is that Flashman is a bully and a coward. And again, this comes directly from the source material, Tom Brown's School Days, uh, in which Flashman is portrayed as a bully and a coward. And it would be inconsistent for Flashman to ever do anything that wasn't mean or spiteful. Still, you don't want to push your audience too far away. Then again, I suppose the fact that these books give you a protagonist that makes you feel uncomfortable is kind of what makes them interesting. Although it does make me hesitant to recommend them. As always, I find these books interesting. I would always recommend them with a bit of caution. Random thought number two. Uh, this book perhaps overuses the deus ex machina plot device uh, to deliver Flashman from various tight, tight spots. More than once in this book, Flashman will appear to be doomed, and then a stranger will appear out of nowhere to save him. Random thought number three. Although this book is about the American West, having it written by a British author does bring a unique perspective to some of the historical details. For example, more than once, Custer's military blunders 
are compared with the charge of the Light Brigade in Crimea, a famous British military blunder. Uh, the bungled diplomatic negotiations with the Sioux at Black Hills and the arrogance of the American government are compared with the British government in Afghanistan and William McNaughton. Uh, both of these events, by the way, are, are things that were referenced in previous Flashman books. Also, the relationship between the Native Americans and the British government is touched on. Sitting Bull apparently had a badge of King George III, which I didn't know and I thought was an interesting historical detail. Uh, I also learned from this book that President Ulysses S. Grant was a big fan of Tom Brown's School Days. Tom Brown's School Days is, of course, the original literary source material that Flashman comes from. Uh, and there's an interesting joke about that in this book. And I learned that before Texas had officially joined the United States, Britain had once entered into negotiations with the object of persuading Texas to join the British Empire. I, I thought that was interesting. Um, Flashman claims that this was a bit of a sore point among the Americans at the time. Uh, random thought number four. I'm not entirely sure why this book has such a politically incorrect title. Flashman and the Redskins. I, I guess it's maybe to keep with the pulpy feel of the story, perhaps. Um, actually, speaking of political incorrectness, large parts of this book do seem aimed at upsetting liberal views of history. The author, George MacDonald Frazier, seems to be of the opinion that modern history has completely whitewashed the Native Americans and made them into passive victims of American imperialism, while ignoring the fact that the Native Americans committed a lot of atrocities themselves. Now, some of this viewpoint does come out of the character of Flashman himself, and admittedly, Flashman is not intended to be a reliable narrator in all things. Uh, but it also comes through in the historical footnotes, where the author himself, George MacDonald Frazier, complains about, quote-unquote, Indian apologists. Now, what the actual historical record is, I'm no expert on. I, I'm interested in history as a hobby, but I'm not an expert historian. It's more than possible that there were plenty of atrocities committed committed on both sides. However, I'm a little uneasy that Frazier seems to think that the Native Americans have gotten off too easily. Uh, I seem to remember them being portrayed as a bad guy more often than not in the movies and films and TV shows I watched as a child. Now, some of these films I watched as a child. I, I grew up in the 1980s, but I watched a lot of old movies that were rerun on cable or, you know, old TV shows rerun on cable. Uh, so a lot of this was dated by the time I was a child, but it, it was still part of our collective media environment, all these old films and old TV shows. Also, there's an interesting book, Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong by James Lowen. Uh, which I'd recommend. Um, he makes a case in that book that contrary to popular belief, most historical textbooks actually downplay the atrocities committed against the, Amer the Native Americans. But to author George MacDonald Fraser's credit, he certainly shows that the atrocities were not all one way. Uh, and he gives a sympathetic viewpoint of the Native American position regarding the Black Hills conflict. Uh, as I mentioned previously, he does place the blame for the negotiations breaking down on the United States government and not on the Native Americans. In conclusion, although I feel conflicted about some of the things inside this book, I certainly can't say that it was a boring read. It did an excellent job of holding my attention. I enjoyed reading it, and I like to think that I learned a few things from it.